Good morning and good Nachmittag to everyone here on the conference line today. Welcome to the fourth annual California Germany Bilateral Energy Conference, an ongoing cooperation between the California Energy Commission and the uh, German Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy. My name is Britta Gross. I'm a managing director at the nonprofit Rocky Mountain Institute, where I lead the global mobility practice after a long career in both aerospace and in automotive. I'll be with you for the next two hours as the master of ceremony, helping to guide the conversations today. California and Germany lead on many issues related to the energy transition and deep decarbonization. And our purpose here is to promote a constructive transatlantic collaboration between these two major governmental bodies. The energy transition and deep decarbonization is a marathon that requires clear goals, a strong strategy, resilience, and a lot of encouragement. Through this conference, California and Germany inspire each other, as well as provide inspiration to their own constituencies and other states and nations. Since 2016, this conference has provided a platform to exchange best practices and opportunities, including an open conversation about lessons learned from challenges and even some mistakes. Over the past three years, this conference has looked at the transmission system and power markets, the energy sector's contribution to decarbonization, and last year, the conference looked at energy storage as a critical part of the solution in transitioning to a very heavy renewables-based energy system. This year's conference is focused on accelerating the widespread adoption of zero emission vehicles. Today's goal is to better understand not only the critical importance of electrifying transportation, but also where we are today and the heightened urgency needed every day for the next 10 years to reach our goal of reducing overall global carbon emissions by 55% by 2030. Let that sink in just 10 short years from where we sit today. I mentioned earlier that this energy and transportation transition is a marathon. And I wanna talk about this notion of being a marathon. In October of 2019 in Vienna, a runner from Kenya named Iliad Kipchoge, who already holds the official record for the world's fastest marathon at just over two hours, ran another marathon under heavily engineered conditions to see whether it could be run in less than two hours. Kipchoge ran the fastest marathon ever recorded in one hour, 59 minutes and 40 seconds. It was a technical achievement that involved unprecedented planning and support. The six mile circuit along the Danube was flat, straight and close to sea level. A car guided the runners by projecting a laser beam in front of them to show the correct pace. An Olympic team of pace setters ran seven at a time in a wind blocking formation devised by an aerodynamics expert. And Kipchoge wore an updated, still unreleased version of Nike running shoes. Because of this support and the fact that Kipchoge wasn't actually competing against anybody, this time won't count as a true record, but this marathon is considered a triumph of humanity. I would argue there are some key takeaways here as we consider our own marathon to electrify our vehicles and decarbonize our energy system. Yes, it's a marathon, but it will need the same unprecedented planning and support. We'll need to take advantage of every technical achievement and every efficiency. And we need pace setters like California and Germany lined up in a wind blocking formation for all the rest of us. Everything is fair game in our fight against climate change if we have any hope of doing it in record time. For today's run of show, we have five very distinguished keynote speakers, three in government leadership positions speaking broadly on the topic of electric vehicles and two speakers with an industry perspective speaking on the business of transitioning to electric vehicles. Following these individual keynotes, we'll have 15 minutes of Q&A to discuss the trends they are seeing and the lessons they're learning. We'll follow this with a 45 minute panel made up of another five experts representing government, industry, academia, and the investment community for their impressions. And finally, we will have the honor of hearing from the German ambassador to the United States, Ambassador Emily Haber, as our closing keynote speaker today. Throughout the course of today's conference, please feel free to ask your questions or give us your impressions in the Q&A area of this Zoom call. There's also an upvoting feature where you can give a thumbs up to questions that have been asked by others. This will allow us to see trends in interest areas among the audience 
and would be very helpful to us as we get into the Q&A. And for those of you so inclined to tweet during this conference, we have a hashtag for you, hashtag CGBEC20. So go ahead and tweet if you're, uh, if you're interested and willing. With that behind us, I want to welcome our first speaker, and she hardly requires any introduction. She is a businesswoman, having served as a trustee of numerous organizations, including the World Council of Religions for Peace, for which she was awarded the Medal of St. Paul, which is the Greek Orthodox Church of America's highest honor. She also served as a diplomat in her role as the former U.S. Ambassador to Hungary. Without further ado, it is my honor to introduce our first keynote speaker, the Lieutenant Governor of California, Eleni Kunalakis. Thank you so much, Britta, for framing today's conference so deftly. Uh, I love the story of the marathon. It truly feels that that is an appropriate um, comparison. And it is an honor to be with all of you here today. I'd like to offer a special welcome to our guests from Germany, uh, including State Secretary Andreas Feit. Uh, it is wonderful to see you again, uh, Emily Haber, German Ambassador to the United States. Um, and I'm truly honored to be able to provide a few opening remarks at this, the fourth annual California-Germany Bilateral Energy Conference. And although we can't be together in person this year, it is inspiring to see our commitment to cooperation and partnership toward achieving our shared climate goals and to see that it truly remains strong. Both California and Germany recognize that on both sides of the Atlantic, we are living right now in challenging times for our people and for our planet. The global pandemic, climate change, the rise of nationalism, all of these issues and others are testing the democratic traditions and institutions which underpin our societies. It is now more important than ever that we stand together to face these challenges while protecting and advancing our common interests and values. California may be geographically distant from Europe, but I want to assure you that we are and always will be Europe's committed transatlantic partner. Over the last few months, the world has watched as devastating wildfires burn in California, and in fact, the entire Western United States. Over 4.1 million acres totaling about 4% of our land area have burned this year. During this fire season alone, five of the six largest fires in California history have happened. There is no question that the increased size and intensity of the fires burning in our state are the result of climate change. Drier, longer summers and warmer winters have weakened our forests. Over 150 million trees have succumbed to the pine bark beetle, the largest forest die off in our recorded history. In order to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and slow global warming, we must act and we must act now. As we recover from our COVID induced economic downturn, California is focused on building our economy back better and stronger and our commitment to transition to clean energy is a key pillar of our recovery efforts. As you know, California is committed to becoming a carbon neutral economy by 2045. Since half of all of our greenhouse gas emissions come from the transportation sector, California must transform the way we move people and goods in order to reach our goal. That is why just a few weeks ago during Climate Week, Governor Newsom issued an executive order requiring all new passenger cars and trucks sold in California to be zero emission by 2035. We know we can do this. Already, California is number one in the United States in electric vehicle manufacturing and infrastructure and EVs are our number one export. We have 34 EV manufacturers in our state and half of all the EVs purchased in the United States are purchased right here in California. Governor Newsom often says that California is America's coming attraction. 
It's the place where the future begins. We are 40 million strong, 27% foreign born. We are blessed with an abundance of natural resources and proud of our open welcoming outlook that has attracted from around the world the best, the brightest, the most future oriented thinkers, doers, educators, creators, and entrepreneurs. As a primary engine of the American economy, we are not shy about raising our voices about the issues that shape the future for us all. By joining forces with Germany and our other European partners, we will combat climate change. By accelerating the widespread adoption of zero emission vehicles, we can reinvent the market for passenger vehicles and help shape the future of mobility. Governor Newsom continues to build upon this record of achievement and leadership. And in a few minutes, you will hear from David Hochschild, chair of the California Energy Commission, who will go into greater detail. But I'd like to note that in addition to the executive order for ZEDS, Governor Newsom has created the California Climate Investment Framework, integrating the climate risk strategies of the state's three largest pension funds into a unified statewide approach. He also launched the California Climate Action Corps just last month with the mission of empowering Californians to take meaningful action on climate change. And even more recently, he elevated the role of natural and working lands in fighting climate change. I'd like to close by thanking all the staff from Germany and California who worked so hard to plan this event today and thank them again for their hard work during this difficult format, but still one that has brought so many of us together from around the world. And while I certainly wish that we were welcoming our German friends to beautiful California here today for an in-person visit, I have no doubt that our fifth annual conference next year, we will all be together again. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor, for those powerful thoughts. And, and thank you for sharing Governor Newsom's uh, quote that I had not actually heard before, and that is that California is America's coming attraction. Um, that is something I can actually uh, blend into this conversation today. That's great, thank you. With that, um, our next uh, keynote speaker has all the right ingredients to be speaking with us today on the topic of electric vehicles. He's an expert in transportation systems and planning in power systems and the utility industry and has expertise in both economics and energy policy. It is my pleasure to introduce to you the German State Secretary of the Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy, State Secretary Andreas Feicht. Well, thank you, Britta Gross, uh, for this uh, very well welcome and introduction. And uh, thank you, dear Lieutenant Governor Eleni Kunalakis for this uh, inspiring remarks and I very much appreciated your words uh, in all, and also in when it comes to the um, deep partnership between Germany and uh, the US and uh, we very hope uh, we, we hope very much that we can um, rely to this uh, partnership. Dear Chair Hochschild, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would have loved to come to California for our fourth annual California Germany conference, but because of the COVID pandemic, this is not possible this year. Still, I am very happy that we can meet virtually. It is important to stay in contact and continue our fruitful exchange on the energy transition. Germany and California share ambitious climate and energy policies. Germany and Europe want to become climate neutral until 2050. The energy transition is one of the key instruments to achieve this. But where do we stand today? In the electricity sector, Germany is on track to reach its targets. For the year 2030, we aim for 65% renewables in the electricity mix. In the first half of this year, already nearly half of our electricity consumption came from renewable, renewable energies. At the same time, our electricity system remains on one of the most reliable in the world with barely any blackouts. But in order to reach our decarbonization targets, we still have a lot to do, especially beyond the electricity sector. We have to make progress on the decarbonization of the heating sector, the industry, 
and even more so with regard to the transport sector. There, we are not on track. We need to further improve energy efficiency and speed up sector coupling, the usage of renewable electricity in those sectors using heat pumps, hydrogen, or electromobility. The transport sector electromobility will be one of the key technologies to achieve greater sector coupling and therefore decarbonization. Germany and the EU are committed to trigger the necessary changes towards more electromobility using the following measures. CO2 pricing for the transport and heating sector, EU regulation for emissions of fleets, subsidies for electric vehicles, and investments in charging infrastructure. Regulation in other markets will also have an impact on EV development in Germany. Therefore, we have closely watched California's recent ban on new internal, internal combustion engine vehicles from 2035. The necessary shift to electromobility brings about great challenges for the DSOs and a massive structural change for the automotive industry. More electric vehicles mean a higher electricity demand, that's obvious. But the low voltage grid can only transport a limited amount of electricity to the charging stations. There is, a, there is therefore a growing need to control electricity flows in a smart way in order to use the grid infrastructure and the available renewable electricity optimally. Smart meter gateways will be instrumental in this regard. We just want to equip as many consumers and decentral producers with certified smart meter gateways as possible. This will enable automatic communication between consumers and producers in the smart grid and ensure data protection and data security. We are currently working on a policy that allows DSOs to temporarily curtail the demand of flexible consumers, such as EVs, in exchange for reduced grid charges and tariffs. This can alleviate grid congestions and mitigate moderate the demand for new power lines. Electromobility is also an opportunity to integrate higher shares of renewable electricity into the grid by serving a smart storage. Together with BMW, we therefore initiated a bi-directional charging management project. The project aims to show how smart meters can facilitate the charging management of EVs so that while plugged in, they can also feed electricity back into the grid when required. The German automotive industry is vital to Germany's economy. The structural change towards electromobility will necessitate significant investments along the entire automotive value chain. German car makers have understood the challenges ahead and will make ample use of the opportunities that, the, that this structural changes offers. They plan to invest 50 billion euro in electromobility by 2024, tripling the number of available EV models from 50 to 150 models. We are committed to establishing Germany as a leading location for the mobility of the future, developing it into a lead market and leading provider of electromobility. We want to support the transition towards more electromobility and moderate the structural changes this entails for Germany. We want to strengthen the existing wallet chains and networks in the automotive and supplier industry and keep them viable for the future. Thereby, Germany will remain a technology open, globally leading location for the automotive industry of the future. Ladies and gentlemen, in order to reach our ambitious goals, it is vital that Ge California and Germany share best practices and cooperate where possible. We can learn a lot from each other, and therefore I'm looking very much forward to the, today's discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, State Secretary. Um, and thank you for your description of the entire system between electric vehicles and the grid, um, including your description of bi-directional power flow opportunities and how much that's gonna mean to us as we sort of go to much larger scale of vehicle and, and transportation electrification. So great structuring for today's conversation. Our third keynote speaker has had a career that has spanned public service, environmental advocacy, and the private sector. 
He's won numerous awards for his work in the solar industry and has broad expertise covering the power grid, e-mobility, and the environment. It's my pleasure to introduce the chair of the California Energy Commission, Chair David Hochschild. Well, thank you so much, Britta, for that generous uh, eulogy. And uh, <laughs> welcome and good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, special thanks to uh, State Secretary Andreas Feicht and the German Federal Ministry of Economy and Energy, our terrific Lieutenant Governor Eleni Kunalakis, and uh, the German Ambassador Emily Haber. Pleasure to have all of you uh, with us today. So as we sit here, uh, California has been uh, suffering from the worst wildfires in our state's history. The urgency of the climate crisis is clear to all 40 million Californians. And one thing uh, those of you in Germany have noticed by now is that the politics are a little bit different in the state of California than what we're seeing in Washington DC lately. And part of this is that in California, there is no debate about climate change. It's happening. We know the urgency and we're taking bold action. And this year in many ways has been the worst of times and the best of times. Um, and I'm reminded of the Chinese script for the word crisis. Uh, so my family's Chinese, my wife is Chinese, my kids are in Chinese school and, and the, the, the script for the word crisis in Chinese, half of that First half of that comes from the word danger, the script for danger, and the second half comes from the script for the word opportunity. And that really is uh, the moment that we're in. Even in the middle of these terrible fires and heat storms that we're having, uh, there's incredible opportunity, transformative opportunity. And I want to lean in together with Germany on bold climate solutions, because I believe in the next year, 2021, we can do more to advance climate solutions than any year in our country, in our country's history or our state's history. Uh, a few weeks ago, the governor signed a pathbreaking, bold executive order that bans the sale of internal combustion engine vehicles by 2035. Um, that is uh, building on momentum that we already have going in California to make this transition. We have three quarters of a million electric vehicles that have been sold in California and many more on the way. Uh, major American companies, including Ford Motor Company, which makes more cars than any other company in the US, uh, transitioning to electric, releasing the Ford F-150 electric uh, late next year. Uh, and of course, Tesla, uh, now the most valuable auto company in the world, uh, pioneering uh, this change. And I think this is gonna look very similar to what happened with solar and wind energy uh, some years ago, where they were sort of dismissed as mythology and no way that they could be big. And now wind and solar are the two fastest growing sources of energy in the world and the two cheapest sources of energy. Um, here in California, it's also clear that the electric grid is ascendant as a climate solution. So we are now at 63% carbon-free electricity on the grid today. And that means solar and wind and geothermal and biomass and small hydro. We're investing very heavily in energy storage. The Energy Commission alone has put $100 million into new energy storage technologies. This next year in California, we're gonna increase energy storage uh, in the utility scale market by tenfold just in the next year. Uh, and really building increased resilience and reliability for the grid as we rapidly uh, decarbonize it. And the nice thing about electric vehicles, they are actually part of the solution for grid reliability. It's more uh, levers at the disposal of the grid operator um, and having intelligent charging protocols. Uh, we are gonna be very ambitious on this, uh, including things we've never done before, electric school buses. The Energy Commission is funding 230 electric school buses uh, around the state with more to follow. Uh, and all these things can be timed so they're charging in ways that best support the reliability of the grid. And of course, beyond vehicles, uh, there's many other important things that are electrifying. High-speed rails being built in California um, and an important length of that right now, the Caltrain's line that connects San Francisco to Silicon Valley, which is a diesel train line, is now being converted to electric and that'll be complete in the next year. Uh, 18 months. And in the building sector as well, uh, we're decarbonizing 35 cities in the last year and a half have adopted 
some form of an electrification preference or elect electrification mandate for new construction. Um, so you're seeing the electric grid rise as a clean energy solution and a climate solution. And uh, really what the governor said is right. California is a postcard from the future for the rest of the country. And it's no coincidence, I think, that uh, Vice President Biden's running mate, Kamala Harris, comes from California. Um, she understands the uh, potency and the urgency of these issues. And I think what's going to happen looking forward, you know, the solar and, and wind industries, of course, the first utility scale solar and wind projects in the world were in California and then scaled. Germany played an incredible role in the 2000s, bringing those technologies to full fruition. Uh, now a similar path with electric vehicles. But I really think these climate solutions and other bold policies that we work on together, uh, Germany and California, are going to spread around the world. And the things that have been dismissed as impractical, uh, a mythology that can't happen, um, can become mainstream. And just one example of that. Uh, two years ago, exactly, California signed into law, actually Governor Jerry Brown signed the, the bill uh, mandating 100% clean energy future for the electric grid by 2045. That was a very hard fought legislative battle. Um, once it got signed, now it's law in 14 states across the US and it's in Vice President Biden's energy plan. And this is just in the space of two years. So I think all of us should have an expansive sense of possibility as we look to the future and really partner more boldly, more ambitiously than we've ever done before. And the last thing I would say is that as we push climate solutions forward and lean into these, these climate solution industries like electric vehicles and wind and solar, that we make every effort possible to lift up disadvantaged communities along the way. So we, at the Energy Commission, 65% of our demonstration projects for new clean energy technologies, including energy storage and microgrids, we're putting those in disadvantaged and low-income communities. 50% of our clean transportation investments, like electric vehicle charging, are going into low-income and disadvantaged communities. And that includes a $384 million plan we just approved a week ago uh, for our clean transportation investments. So we have to lift up all boats as we build out this clean energy future. That's the right way to do it. And it's also what's gonna help sustain the movement for the long-term. So I wanna thank everyone for joining us today virtually. Um, I always uh, look forward to these, partly because my name is the only, only conference I go to where my name is actually correctly pronounced. It's mispronounced at all the American conferences. So uh, thank you, uh, Andreas Feicht, for pr correctly pronouncing Hochschild. It's not so often uh, that it gets pronounced correctly. And uh, just my thanks to everyone. Um, we look forward to, to doing this in person uh, next year and, and for many years to come. Thank you all. Thank you, Chair Hochschild, and uh, I know the feeling about getting your name butchered or pronounced correctly, so I'm with you there. Um, and thank you for mentioning, number one, bringing up the subject of disadvantaged communities, and then also I think there, there is probably broad interest on this call about the tenfold increase in energy storage on the grid coming into California. I think there's a particular interest around that. I hope we can get to that uh, through the Q&A. So thank you very much again, Chair. Let's turn now to um, two voices from industry. The first one, uh, our next speaker, has deep experience in the automotive industry. He led BMW's cooperations efforts uh, on the first demonstration electric vehicle, the Mini E. Many of you remember that vehicle in the late 2000s, um, including establishing the relationships with energy companies, research projects, and governments. He's a longtime policy and legislation uh, expert and has shaped BMW's sustainability communications. Please welcome the Head of Government and External Affairs at the BMW Group, Glenn Schmidt. Good morning and good afternoon, Britta. Thank you very much for framing our discussion. Distinguished uh, guests and panelists from California and, and Germany, it's my pleasure to be able to, to speak briefly during this conference. I'd like to really put an industry perspective on EV uptake. And we're seeing really worldwide that Corona and the crisis that we're going through is a catalyst uh, and can really be accelerating things. Some of these things are negative, but um, a lot of these things I think are also positive. And what we're seeing is that Corona and the crisis is actually accelerating the uptake and the pace of sustainability in terms of awareness. And it's interestingly enough from a BMW group perspective, also accelerating the uptake 
of electrified vehicles. And I want to put two numbers out there. If we look at the first nine months of this year, um, from a BMW group perspective, sales of electrified vehicles have been up by 20% worldwide. And in Germany, um, they're actually up by 44%. So a lot of that is also driven by incentives. But we see, despite the crisis, that the uptake rate of electric mobility is there. We expect next year um, in Europe that one of four new vehicles that we sell will have a plug. So it will be either a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle or a fully electric vehicle. And by 2030 worldwide, we're expecting up to 7 million electrified vehicles on the roads from the BMW group and about two thirds of those would be fully electric. I'd like to spend the next couple of minutes and I have seven minutes, which is the reason why I've come up with sort of seven points to sort of reflect from a BMW group perspective on the last seven years of electric mobility. Um, we introduced the BMW i3 in 2013, our first fully electric purpose-built electric vehicle at a global level. And that was really preceded by um, worldwide field trial activities, also notably in the United States, in New York, but also in Los Angeles, where we worked together with local partners to test this technology. And the Mini um, E was um, debuted in the year 2008 at the LA Motor Show. And I'd really like to talk about seven, seven points to reflect on. And the first point is really persistency. Um, when we introduced the BMW i3, there were sales there, there was demand, but it was very modest. And normally when you introduce an electric vehicle or an elect a vehicle, you have rapid uptake for two or three years and then it kind of goes down. But the, the sales of the BMW i3 have been actually going up year after year. So it's really about persistency. Then the second point is really think about scale in terms of industrializing. We started off with one model, um, but really rolled that out into the entire product portfolio. Uh, we are now in the midst of introducing our fifth generation of electric drivetrain. Um, that fifth generation of electric drivetrain will be coming with the BMW iX3, which is a fully electric version of the X3, uh, which is in the middle of, of, of global launch right now. And by 2023, we will have 25 electrified uh, vehicles on the market, half of which will be fully electric. So really think in terms of scale, in terms of how to ramp up the technology. The third point I'd like to make is really the necessity to take a fact-based and holistic approach. As we have more electrified vehicles on the road, I believe the focus will also go to not just tailpipe emissions, but also to emissions along the entire value chain and up, upstream emissions as well. 40% of a fully electric vehicle CO2 emissions come from the battery cell production alone, which is why I really think it makes sense when you think about electric vehicles to think of them in a holistic um, frame, to think of them in, in, in the entire context. For this generation five electric drivetrain that we're introducing, we've taken the strategic decision to um, purchase cells that were created with 100% renewable energy to really get that CO2 output and emission level down. And that will save 10 million tons of CO2, which is, if you wanna frame it or put it into perspective, about the yearly CO2 emissions from a mid-sized city like in Munich. Fact-based, I think, is a very important point that we need to be looking at in our supply chain. If you look at the CO2 footprint of an average BMW um, last year in the supply chain, um, about 10 tons of CO2 are emitted. By 2030, we expect, due to electrification, that average amount of CO2 footprint to increase to 14 tons without any measures, without taking any proactive measures. However, with measures that we've decided, we want to take the, that amount of CO2 down to eight tons on average for the supply chain of an average BMW. So it's not just about tailpipe emissions. I think we need, need to be looking at the entire value chain. The next point I'd like to make, point number four, is really the need to take responsibility. Where are, for example, raw materials coming from, from electrified vehicles? Um, cobalt, lithium, rare earths, for example. For this reason, we've decided um, for this fifth generation of um, electric drivetrains to purchase uh, lithium, to purchase cobalt directly and provide that sustainable material to um, our um, battery um, producers um, so that we really can go into the value chain and, and purchase these raw materials 
um, on, on our own to ensure that they have the highest standards, ethical standards as well in terms of where they're produced and how, they're, how the, these minerals are extracted from the earth. The fifth point I'd like to make is uh, the shift from the internal combustion engine to electric mobility is a huge transition. It's a huge experiment. Um, and we need to be careful that we're not creating losers and winners. Uh, this needs to be a social transition. Um, we have, for this reason, decided to really electrify every production facility that we have. Um, so every plant will get an electric model. Um, every plant that produces components has something to do with electrification. And that really allows us to ramp up um, as we produce less internal combustion engine vehicles, conventional, and ramp up for production of electric mobility to have that flexibility and to move in terms of competencies and also move in terms of our workforce. And currently 30% of our employees who work in the production of electric drivetrains actually previously um, were involved in the production of conventional vehicles. The sixth point I'd like to make, and I think this is very important, it's really about creating ecosystems. Um, the BMW group OEMs in the automotive industry can't really do it alone. We need to have strong partnerships in terms of charging, in terms of grid. Um, and um, we have one notable example, um, our BMW Charge Forward project in California, where we work together with Pacific Gas and Electric to really be testing and pilot the use of smart charging. And the most recent findings demonstrate that with smart charging, you can actually reduce greenhouse gas emissions for an electric vehicle by 32%. So we need to be partnering um, and, and working on this together. And my sev seventh point that I'd like to make is, I think we need to emotionalize. Beyond the academic discussion that we have here, don't forget the customer. Um, we need to get the customer excited and thrilled about what's happening. And let me just give you a few examples. Um, BMWs, conventional BMWs are renowned for their sound engineering, for the sound of the inline six cylinder. Well, in the transition to the electric uh, world, we are, for example, working together with Hans Zimmer, who's a very renowned Hollywood sound producer to create iconic electric sounds. Uh, why not have a thrilling sound of an electric vehicle as well? And getting, getting customers excited about electric mobility, um, I think is very, very crucial. And I recall when I was involved in the mini e-field trial um, in Los Angeles, looking at uh, the content users, uh, these, these, these first pioneers um, and, and their smiles uh, when they got out of these uh, first electric vehicles, we referred to them as EV smiles. So we need to be certainly getting a lot of EV smiles. And to close, um, I think when it comes to the environment, you need to take sides, um, which is why the BMW Group um, agreed to join um, California Framework Agreement um, for greenhouse gas emission standards from 2021 to 2026, agreed to higher standards than what is currently um, required federally. And we think this is the right way to go, um, to have one set of standards and to team up. And what happens in California doesn't stay in California. California is definitely a front runner in terms of what's going on. And I think there's a lot of potential in, in intensifying the cooperation between California and Germany as well to move this in the right direction. Thank you very much. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you for that. Um, you know, I was particularly taken by your comments about persistency in product, getting out there and, and sticking to it. I think that's a tough thing to, to sometimes ask industry to do. Thank you for that. Um, your, your comment about the huge experiment this is, is really notable coming from industry. So I think that's always a good perspective. And I think that's sort of my, where my mind goes. I really love this forum here because we're talking about government and we're talking about industry perspectives. And we know we can't get to scale at all if, if, if both sides aren't pushing in the same direction and getting the job done. So we need both parties and we just have to figure out what it's gonna take. So appreciate the thoughts from industry very, very much, Glenn. Let's have one more speaker from industry. Our final keynote speaker leads a company that has built the largest fast charging network for electric vehicles in the US. She has a long career in energy and renewable energy in particular. She served in the Obama administration as assistant secretary and acting undersecretary of energy following a long career at the EPA or Environmental Protection Agency. She specializes in technology commercialization and policy it's my pleasure to introduce the Chief Executive Officer of EVGO, Kathy Zoy. Thanks, Britta. Um, 
So great to be here. I mean, as a 30 year veteran of the energy sector, I was so glad to hear about this dialogue between the leaders of Germany and California and even more thrilled to hear that this year's topic is electrification of transportation. So from an industry market growth perspective, there's really for us three essential factors to achieving mass adoption of EVs, um, range, cost, and then fueling, which, which in this case is charging. So on, in terms of range, the OEMs have done a great job. We now, obviously the cars that are coming to market have well over 200 miles of range, 320 kilometers for our friends from Germany on a single charge. That really is helpful for consumers. The second thing of course is, is cost of the vehicle. And again, with batteries, that's and with EVs, that's batteries. And what we've, what we've witnessed is the same pattern um, as we've seen in solar 10 years ago, it was $1,000 a kilowatt hour for, for uh, batteries. Now we're down maybe in the mid hundreds per kilowatt hour today. That, that, that sort of decrease in a, in a decade is phenomenal. All of that while, while increasing the power density and the durability and the continuous innovation of the chemistries of those batteries. So that's great. The third part of it, of course, is where, where we come in, where EVgo comes in and that's charging. The estimates are that the US needs to build about uh, an additional 500,000 um, level two chargers in the next few years and 50,000 DC fast chargers. Um, and that's where we're we are working really, really hard. Let me give you a quick background on EVgo. Um, as Britta says, we're the largest um, public fast charging in, in, uh, company in the US. We've got over 800 locations. We site, build, own and operate that infrastructure. Um, what's more, we're powered by 100% renewable energy because we're very committed to the environment. Um, Right now, even though we're still just at the beginning of this um, transformation of the of the transportation sector, 83% of Californians already live within 10 miles of an EVgo um, station. So that's really great, but the work is just beginning. Um, and as a collection of people here on this conference with a shared interest in electrification, let me just give you my perspective on, on where EVgo sees the sort of four major dynamic forces that are that are shaping the charging industry per se. One, EVs are getting more powerful, both literally and figur figuratively. Two, driver needs are, are broadening. Three, utility requirements are evolving. And I think David, talk, Chairman Hogshaw talked about that at the beginning. And four, government imperatives are intensifying. So our response to those dynamic forces is to collaborate, to partner financially, and to communicate honestly about both the opportunities and the barriers that might inhibit our ability to our ability in the infrastructure world to grow at the pace that's required to support the transformation. Just to demonstrate though that I'm, I'm optimistic about how we're gonna face all of these dynamic forces, let me highlight a couple of examples. So we'll, the, with the structure of problem solutions. So the challenge, one of the dynamic forces is that the cars are becoming higher power themselves. So what we're doing at EVgo and in the charging industry writ large is we're actually building infrastructure that's capable of charging those cars more quickly to match those power needs. It used to be that a, that a fast charger was definition was 50 kilowatts. Well, now what we're building are stations that are 150 to 350 kilowatts. That's become our norm. We're changing with the industry. Second one, how are um, there are shifts in the EV driver and deeds, the demographics in the old days, you know, the early days of the I3, oftentimes that, that I3 was a second car, a get around town car, but now, People who live in apartments are having them as the, their only car. They need to have them for long distances. There's a rise in EV ride share and delivery. Um, so and those folks who drive those cars need to charge them quickly away from home every single day, not just once a week. And they may not have access to home charging. So the charging industry's response is that we are building many more convenient fast chargers and we're building them with larger footprints. The third factor, the dynamic force, is that they're evolving requirements of the utility grid. So what we're seeing here, of course, is as, as David highlighted, and as, as our colleagues from Germany highlighted, the power supply mix has shifted and it's more reliant on renewables. So the charging industry's response is to have charging that matches utility needs and, and, and enables distributed storage so that we can contribute and do our part to ensure the grid is stable and that it is environmentally friendly. And we, what we need to, to in partnership with the utilities is to be able to have utility rates that match our contribution to helping that grid stabilization. 
And of course, the fourth, which brings the two, um, Germany and California together across the board, is climate urgency and equity are imperatives that are increasing in their intensity. And so what we're doing in the charging sector is we're accelerating our build programs to meet those challenges, to ensure broad geographic and demographic a demographic reach in all areas of where we operate ahead of demand, ahead of demand to ensure that everybody is served. And what we need in government um, is collaboration and, and, and ha have government as a financial partner to help underwrite pri the private sector building ahead of demand. So let me just fin finish with saying like the keys for us are collaboration, innovation, and agility and we, we are, we're proud of our track record at partnering with government and with civil society and getting there. And we look forward to doing much more because I think we all agree on this conference. We must and need, must, need, must meet the goals um, of, of addressing climate change. Thanks, Britta. Thank you, Kathy, very, very much for your perspective. Really appreciate this, uh, again, this industry perspective um, combined with the government perspective. It, it's pretty exciting to be part of this. So if I can call back all the five keynote speakers, we have a little bit of time where we could do some Q&A. And so number one, I really appreciate you guys hanging around. Um, Lieutenant Governor, State Secretary Feicht, uh, Chair Hochschild, there we go, Glenn and Kathy. Thank you guys so much. Let's just start with one question here. Um, Many countries around the world have begun to announce future bans on the sale of new um, internal combustion engine vehicles. We've heard Glenn's perspective, but let's just delve into this just a little bit more. The UK, right, it had a 2040 goal. They pulled it back to 2035, and I think a couple of weeks ago they announced 2030 was the new phase out date uh, for combustion engine vehicles. Um, Canada, France, Scandinavia in general, Israel, India, even China's looking at a, at a ban of of uh, at a future ban of internal combustion engine vehicles. As we heard from several of you guys, Governor Newsom issued an executive order of almost a month ago now that would ban new internal combustion engine vehicle sales in passenger vehicles by 2035. What's interesting, I don't recall hearing it here yet today, the leader of the conservative Christian Social Union Party in Bavaria, and also he's coincidentally the president of Bavaria as well, Marcus Zuda, supported this announcement. How, how significant do you think these two announcements in both California and in Germany for the, from the conservative party are? And should we view these as some kind of tipping point at this point? Anyone wanna weigh into this one? Maybe I, I may to, to intervene, uh, Britta. Um, First of all, let me say that this is not yet policy in Germany. Uh, Markus Söder is a very important politician uh, in the coalition also, not only in Bavaria, but also in Berlin. And uh, he might be become even more important in the future. No, no, nobody knows by now, but uh, <laughs> but still this uh, ban um, is not, uh, not uh, part of the policy in, in Germany so far. And from my perspective, I'm quite reluctant when it comes to bans because what we what we should have is a framework and um, and circumstances where um, the industry has clear regulations, of course, and also knows what we want to achieve, but uh, that we that we have uh, freedom and, and liberty for technology approaches and uh, development. So um, from from the German perspective, when you when when you look at the whole German economy, not only not only the electricity sector, we've got an uh, an energy consumption of 2,500 terawatt hours uh, per year. And only 600, uh, about 600 terawatt hours is, is electricity consumption by now. So this will raise up, of course, uh, but it is impossible to electrify all the consumption in Germany. Uh, so we do need also other uh, energy sources. Uh, that's why we launched a hydrogen strategy by the summer this year. And we need also other other sources like biomass and uh, and uh, let me let me call it molecules and all, not only electrons but also molecules, and this is also true for the mobility sector, of course. So uh, a, a lot of uh, vast uh, share of the mobility sector will be electrified, but not, not everything. So it, uh, there will be a need of, for hydrogen and also for other sources and. 
And the German car makers, um, they don't only produce, of course, for the German market or for the European market, but for the world market. So um, is it uh, very uh, reasonable to think that by 2035, there will be no um, diesel or petrol or gas-based uh, uh, vehicles worldwide? Or is it, is it, can it also be that synthetic uh, fuels, uh, e-fuels are, are needed and also used worldwide? So therefore, I'm uh, quite reluctant to say uh, we just um, uh, push it out of the system, but what we have to do is to, to give clear circumstances and frameworks. Thank you. I would add a little bit uh, to that, which is, I mean, I do think the moment that we're in with climate does call for bold vision. That's what this really is. And I think the governor was right to, to do this. <clears throat> I think the transformation is coming um, and that we need to remember the economic upside of it. So this year in California, the number one export by value for the entire state was electric vehicles. Um, and we do have 34 companies manufacturing, not just Tesla, but also uh, bus manufacturers like BYD and Proterra and, and more on the way. And I think when you, you know, make a bold um, policy, such as an internal combustion engine vehicle ban, I want to be clear, this is not a ban on the vehicles. This is a ban on new vehicles, new passenger vehicles being sold. So used vehicles will be allowed to be sold and so forth. But Directionally, what that does is it drives investment, um, in our case, you know, into California for the ZEV uh, sector. And um, just generally speaking, part of the reason I think California uh, is pursuing these visions beyond the obvious need on climate is it has been very successful for us from an economic perspective. We're getting 53% of US clean tech venture money is coming into California to companies like Cathy's and others that are doing pioneering work. Um, and uh, the, the economy here in California with these kind of bold policies, including you know, SB 100 mandating 100% clean energy, which was also a very contested uh, fight, um, but it's caused us to significantly outperform the US economy. Uh, over, since 2000, the US economy uh, grew about 35%, California's grew about 46%, and these policies are a big part of the reason why. So I really see it as economic vision as well as climate vision. And if I can just um, uh, tear off of what uh, David is saying, I, I think that to me, the most compelling fact in all of this is that um, as we look at our 2045 goal of being carbon neutral, you have to look at passenger cars because 41%, 41% of our, uh, of our um, greenhouse gas emissions in the state of California come from our cars. You know, you think of La La Land and the people sitting on the freeway in their cars. It is the way that we developed in a post-automobile society, in a, the post, you know, development of the automobile in California. We don't have the kinds of towns that you see in Europe. People need to get from here to there, primarily in the state by getting in their car. So 41% of our greenhouse gas emissions come from cars. If you add the refining of the fuel for those cars, you get over 50% of our greenhouse gas emissions. If we are going to get to our goal in this state, we have to do something about cars. And so I would put it this way, David, I think it actually starts with the vision, uh, the reality that Californians know that uh, we are feeling the impacts of climate change, the reality, which is we have to do something about transportation if we're going to get to our goals. And then once we set the standard, when, when, when industry sees how serious we are about it, and California being the largest consumer market in the country, but they see opportunity. Uh, they see that if they can produce uh, the, uh, the um, technology that the, we're creating the market for them. So um, I guess I kind of liken it to the transition from incandescent light bulbs to, uh, to the uh, kind of light bulbs that we use now that are, that are so much more efficient they're different and it takes some getting used to from people. And nobody likes being told by the government 
um, what they can and you know what products they can and cannot have. But in general, here in the state of California, the the real threat of climate change and the impact on people's lives, inability to get insurance if their house is too close to a fire zone, uh, they're ready, people are ready. And, and the actual shift, and I say this as someone who has been uh, driving uh, an alternative uh, fuel vehicle now since the early 2000s, uh, when I got my first compressed natural gas car, um, uh, it's this is surmountable. People are up to it. And, and can I just say, Glenn, when you talked about the idea of socializing how electric cars sound, you know, from the rev of an engine to how it feels. I mean, I tell you, my husband drives a Tesla. It's an amazing thing. You feel like you're just gliding in this car. So we do have some work to do in the socialization of this new product for people, but, uh, but the state is setting the course and by and large public opinion is ready to go. Yeah, oh, Kathy, please. It just just quickly with a little bit of an added industry perspective there. I mean, I think what, what, what is so marvelous what we're seeing and, and to your question of have we reached an inflection point? government policy sets a target out there and then the the forces of industry get on board you know over 300 billion dollars is being invested by the car companies to electrify in part because that 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 beacon was set by government policies and now you've got the forces of innovation that come behind that all of those companies to to reach that goal and it will accelerate. It's almost like a snowball coming downhill or, or, or through an academic perspective, we're, we're, we're on an experience curve. So there's early adoption and then, and, and, and Eleni's right, with the, what happened with, with light bulbs to LEDs, which are now mainstream and cheaper than the alternative. What happened with solar? Again, when, when Germany established a feed-in tariff, that, that was catalytic at getting industry to say, oh my gosh, this isn't just niche, this is mainstream. And then you get capital, private capital being invested to create what consumers want. And I think that's what we're seeing here with electric vehicles. Glenn? Yeah, if I could just comment as well, thanks. <clears throat> I, I don't think we need to be banning. I think we need to be promoting. Um, and that's a that's just a different, different approach. I'd like to give you an example why we don't need bans. The BMW Group offers the same a variety of products, the whole lineup um, across the board at a global level. And that means we have internal combustion engine vehicles, plug-in hybrids, as well as um, fully electric vehicles. And currently in Norway, our new vehicle sales of electrified vehicles is well over 80%. That means eight of 10 vehicles that we sell in Norway have a plug. But that wasn't actually done through banning, that was done through promoting, incentivizing, creating tax grants, uh, having the right infrastructure. And in other markets where we don't see that, then we see that the share of electrified vehicles is maybe at five, uh, at best six or 7%. And right now we are witnessing in Germany uh, the real takeoff of electrified vehicles. In September, 16% um, share in total. Uh, diesel's at around 30%. And that's not because of a ban, it's because people are realizing this is a, a fascinating technology uh, and you have incentives in place. But the question will really be is, how sustainable is that? What happens once you remove the incentives? And we need to be creating natural demand for these electric vehicles, that customers um, want to be driving them, that car companies can be making money from these vehicles. And I don't think um, banning, banning is the right way uh, to do things. And things need to be really balanced, right? We're, we're talking about a green deal in the EU. So a deal implies that both sides have come up with an agreement. So uh, we have the target there, but what does that mean in terms of charging infrastructure? 76% um, of all European charging infrastructure is just in four countries. And it's not surprising that because of that, 67% of our electrified vehicle sales are in these four markets. So we need to be not just doing stick, but also carrot. And traditionally, California has been very strong at that um, with the ZEF mandate, and not just setting the targets, but also thinking about how to stimulate the market and create, uh, and to create, that, uh, create that demand. And it really needs to be balanced from both sides. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, everybody, on that one. I knew that was going to be a popular question. Uh, maybe the one thing we can agree on um, is that we all know that EV awareness is a challenge around the world, here in the US, of course. Um, and so maybe what, what's happening is here, is here is that we've got this very provocative conversation taking place. And that certainly is raising some awareness. So I think from that standpoint, 
I think it's a really good conversation to be having and putting sort of a, a metric out there, a milestone uh, in the ground and we can work towards it. Can I, I'm looking at the questions here. I wasn't gonna go in the direction of hydrogen, but I just wanted maybe briefly touch on hydrogen because I see a couple questions here from Raul Grenod and Guido Hamacher about hydrogen. And, and, and one, of the, one of these guys claims that um, the Germany has far outpaced California in installing hydrogen fueling stations, yet is far behind California in the adoption of fuel cell vehicles. Anyone want to give us some thoughts on where hydrogen fits into, for example, Glenn, your portfolio, or what part of the puzzle this fits in? And can you just talk about infrastructure versus the, the vehicles themselves? Anyone want to weigh in? I can take a first stab at that question, perhaps. Um, I think I think hydrogen and fuel cell electric vehicles will will probably take off initially where, where you don't have um, the ability to use a battery electric vehicle. So um, trucks, um, heavy vehicles, um, also um, shipping. So I think that's a, that's a natural place to to start using hydrogen in the, in those areas where you don't have a battery electric vehicle uh, or a battery electric alternative. From our perspective, hydrogen is definitely a valid route. Um, it's more applicable to the larger vehicles um, and where you need to have really rapid charging, where you need to have a, a lot of power. Um, and it's the same type of debate I see happening as well. Like uh, it reminds me a bit of um, uh, electric mobility um, about 12 or 13 years ago, this chicken or egg, you know, do we come up with the, the vehicles or do we come up with the charging infrastructure? Um, from a BMW Group perspective, it's it's valid. Um, we are working on this technology. Um, we'll be piloting a small fleet in the next two years. Um, but in terms of um, series adoption, we think that's a, a question that we need to be answering um, for the next couple of years. And it's likely to be in the second half of the 20s in terms of actually when you see a series of fuel cell hydrogen electric vehicle from BMW. Thank you for that transparency. Anyone else want to weigh in on, on a hydrogen fuel cells? From, from my point of view, if I, if I may, um, I would agree to that what Glenn uh, just said. Um, this is also part of our hydrogen strategy in Germany. We, we, we see, as I, as I already mentioned, that um, hydrogen is, is crucial in order to, um, in order to uh, reach our uh, uh, climate goals by 2030 and also 2050. But um, it is uh, needed for uh, those sectors who are hard to be electrified economically or, uh, or technically and uh, physically. It means more or less for uh, steel industry, for example, or chemistry. And in the mobility sector for long haul vehicles, for heavy vehicles in freight. And so uh, when, when we look at the aviation sector, so um, Airbus is just evaluating the question whether they should um, develop um, hydrogen uh, sourced um, uh, aviation or plane or so. So um, there will be also, from my point of view, a share of the market uh, also for, um, for, for vehicles or cars, but that, that will be a smaller share of the, of the whole market. Uh, but hydrogen as a whole is, is crucial for, in order to, to reach our goals. Of course, uh, climate neutral hydrogen, so um, uh, green hydrogen or decarbonized hydrogen. Yeah, I would just add to that. I think uh, we have a lot to learn from Germany on the power to gas sector. Germany is way ahead of us on, on that with respect to hydrogen. With respect to vehicles, um, <clears throat> we have three quarters of a million zero emission vehicles that have been sold in California. Those are almost all passenger vehicles. Uh, and hydrogen fuel cells represent less than 1% of that. So it is clear, I mean, electric on the passenger vehicle side has really dominated and that, that is growing over time. So I think the niche that I'm seeing for hydrogen vehicles uh, is as Andres and Glenn suggested in areas where it's harder to electrify. So some of the heavy duty space, um, but keep in mind, I mean, the each year the area that electric vehicles can serve kind of grows as battery density increases and battery costs go down. So just as an example, the Ford F-150 electric version is getting introduced uh, late next year. That's going to be a 300 mile range truck. Um, that's the most popular truck sold in the US. And so those things, I mean, it is electric is still expanding gradually. Um, and of course, you know, Tesla's announced um, their trajectory to cut uh, battery costs another 50% from where they are today. 
Um, but I think the heavy, we're still investing in hydrogen fuel cell um, refueling infrastructure. We're required to do $20 million a year. We put in, I think today, 130 something million into that. Um, but I see the heavy duty space as really being the, the niche. Maybe again, I'll just tag on with David, the Port of LA and Long Beach in California. It's the largest port complex in the United States. And we see that as having a real potential for being a hub um, for this technology. Thank you all for that. Let's, I'm, I'm looking at another question over here and there's just so much interest in the power outages in California and trying to learn from those. Could, could you guys just um, help Max Miller and a bunch of thumbs up folks that are upvoting this question, talk about like what's, you know, I know that there's a, it's a complex scenario of, especially the last one with the heat wave across the entire Southeast. There were some issues at maybe a particular natural gas plant. I know that there may be some forecasting day ahead issues. You know, can you just tell the what 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 advice do you have as EVs really scale up on the grid? Does California have suggestions or insights about what to look out for relative to the power grid and its stability and reliability? Yeah, I can speak to that. So uh, in August, on the night of Friday, August fourteenth, we had a two and a half hour blackout, and Saturday, August fifteenth, we had an hour and a half blackout. Those are the first time we've had. Uh, outages like that in 20 years. Um, it did not affect 97% of Californians, but it made a lot of news. And um, it actually, and so this was during a historic heat storm. We, as, as you all know, the highest reliably recorded temperature in world history happened in August in California during that heat storm. And what was unique about it wasn't just that the temperatures were elevated, but that it was extended over five days. Uh, and there was a sort of perfect storm. We have to do better and we are doing better. There's a huge focus on this. We've met with the governor multiple times in the legislature. Um, and the good news is this is a solvable problem. Okay, so I wanna be clear, there's a lot of impacts from climate, but just generally speaking, um, we have a lot of control about the degree of resilience we add into the system. Um, and we're adding a lot. As I mentioned, we're going to do a 10x increase in energy storage, but also procuring a bunch of additional resources. The thing I would say that there's another tool that we're really focused on, which is managing demand much more intelligently. Um, you know, historically, we have thought of demand as a sort of fixed thing, and you have to produce enough generation to meet that. And it turns out there's a lot of demand that can be uh, moved. You can pre-cool buildings and many other things, including electric vehicle charging uh, protocols and so forth, and we're doing that. So this is a really intense year of focus for us on building that resilience, and I do believe it's a solvable problem. Thank you. Maybe, you know, that, that's, um, first of all, thank you for that very, very clear explanation and actually the opportunity it presents to actually get this right. I, I can't even imagine a more exciting time to be either in the electric grid space at a utility or in automotive sector. I just, I, this is it. The, the, the opportunities here are wonderful. I do want to ask, there's so many good questions in the Q&A, but let me ask the last question here, just to get one more um, question out here about, you know, this, this relationship between government and industry. Policy and regulation have created the EV market we're looking at today. I think there's pretty general consensus about that. We are where we are because of policy and regulation. And incentives for vehicles and infrastructure have been critical. But at some point, the private market has to become the main scaling mechanism to widespread EV adoption. So what does government need now to see from industry, the business community and private investors? And what more does industry need to see from government? Can we weigh well, in? I'll just say question? briefly, I think the role of government here is to set the vision and then to create market certainty to the greatest degree possible. And I think what we have learned and people, you know, I get told a lot when we travel around the world and meet with other countries, learn so much from California. I said, learn, <laughs> learn from our mistakes. We have made a lot of mistakes along the way. I think one of our biggest mistakes early was we did a lot of short-term policies, you know, incentives for solar that lasted a year or two, then the money ran out. That is not the way to go. And, and pretty much all energy and transportation policy that deals with climate today in California takes long term. So this uh, ban on internal combustion engine vehicle sales, uh, that is a 15 year policy. That, that's a 2035 policy. We're in 2020 today. Um, you know, we're, we're setting these trajectories 
And then we do a lot with, with carrots. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned the solar industry. We, we have a million solar roofs now in California. That was a $3 billion 10 year incentive program that started off subsidizing, you know, nearly uh, a third of the cost. Uh, now that pro program is done and solar is mainstream and we're still doing some mandates. So we, we've now required solar on every new home in California through our energy commission codes. Um, and then the, the market on retrofits is very healthy too, because you had this runway that created stability and market certainty and allowed investment to come in and cost to come down. And now it's off and running on its own. So I think that's the role of government uh, to create that certainty in the long-term goal and then really encourage investment and cost reduction. Wonderful. Yeah, from, my, from my point of view, maybe if I may, um... I would, I would agree to that what David said, uh, market design, uh, regulation, certainty, um, also to decide uh, quickly. We, we decided this year or last year to establish a CO2 price system in, 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 in the heating and, and transportation sector. This is quite light. We should have done it much earlier. But uh, what we should also take into account as government is uh, the infrastructure. So um, infrastructure is nothing the industry can do uh, by itself. It's a, it's a public, um, let's say, a job to do. Um, expanding the grid, the electricity grid, for example, um, is something the, the governments have to, um, to uh, give the impulse for that. And uh, we are in, in Germany, we are quite slow on that. So, what we were we were very uh, successful to expand the, um, the the production and the capacity of renewables, but, but we were very late in um, in uh, bringing the infrastructure to, to place. And uh, but without infrastructure, um, it's it's hard to achieve all the goals we have. So this is a, this is a something uh, we want to do now much better when it comes to the hydrogen economy. So uh, thinking about what, what the industry is doing, regulatory framework, CO2 price, for example, but also uh, the, the, the connection to the infrastructure is very, very important. Thank you. So I think it's just really important that we recognize that in disrupting the status quo, there will be winners and losers. Uh, and that we all need to get ready for that reality because um, I don't know, it seems to me an appropriate time to harken back to 2006 when the film came out, Who Killed the Electric Car? Uh, that was 14 years ago. And here we are in a very different situation. We are poised not just to nibble around the edges of the market that exists for the internal combustion engine, but to go into this tipping point zone where where we move away from the internal combustion engine and toward zero emission vehicles in a very substantial way. And I think that when we look at the way that technology has disrupted industry so quickly in this digital revolution, it's different with um, fossil fuel industry. And I have no doubt as a former US ambassador to Hungary and someone who worked on energy security issues affecting Europe and Germany in particular, obviously a very big part of that, um, that there will be pushback from that industry and we need to get ready for it. But at the same time, when uh, we look at the politics uh, of what is happening in California, as David noted, uh, when that no one here denies climate, we're living with climate change, we're living with it. Uh, there is an adoption process happening. There is governmental uh, uh, initiatives like uh, the 2035 executive order. Um, these, and of course what we're seeing, um, and Kathy knows this very well, is that we're hitting critical mass of charging stations in our, in our state. Uh, we are poised to hit this tipping point. And uh, I think it's incredibly exciting, but we're not there yet. Uh, so it's going to take the constant uh, uh, commitment to these goals, the helping of industry in order to get there and the encouragement of industry to get there, but also the anticipation that there may be pushback because as I said, there are others out there with equities who may not be so excited about this change as we are. Kathy? 
Yeah, so um, thanks to David and Elena and, and, um, and Andreas as well. I agree with David's uh, articulation of the, the critical importance of the vision to create the certainty so that you create a safe haven for private capital. There is private capital, but private capital doesn't like high risk. So if, if there's something that's out there that's a beacon and it can be a 15 year vision that's binding, private capital can mobilize around that. Um, the, 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 the proviso there is if it's really early stage or if it's extremely high risk, then supplementing that vision with some private, with, with some government money is important. And again, David gave some examples in the early days of solar, beautifully designed policies where in the very early stages of the technology development and deployment, there was the cost share between government and private sector, but that was phased down over time. That's, that's, that's as I say, that, to, to, as an industry person who's also been a policy person, I think that that works very, very well. The third area that I think is worth highlighting though is soft costs. One of the things that's crazy that, that government can really be helpful with is ensuring that it's easy to do business, that, 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 that the utilities are making it easier for, I say, for us to build charging stations or that local, gov local governments are actually allowing the permitting. And again, we've seen this in solar, we've seen this in batteries, we're seeing this with charging infrastructure, um, we're seeing it with manufacturing. So those sorts of things are not necessarily, they don't necessarily require taxpayer dollars per se, but they require a collaboration and an honest communication about, boy, this will be a heck of a lot. What, what should take six weeks to get approved is taking 12 months. And, and, and it's an unintended consequence of sometimes when we've got government processes that are, again, nobody wants them to be overbearing, but they end up inhibiting the deployment of private of the capital to solve public policy problems. Last thoughts, Glenn. Last thoughts from my end, I'll keep it really, really short. I think government is important, industry is important, but bottom line is the consumer, the customer. The customer needs to be excited about everything. And I think from a customer perspective, there are only three things that are important. An attractive product, and those products are out there, and more and more of these products are coming. Do I have the charging infrastructure? I think there's still homework to be done in that area to have not only a public, but also private infrastructure and incentives in place and incentives. And if that mixture of these three things work, then electric mobility will have that tipping point. And there's no doubt about it. This is an electric revolution. It's going to be happening. Thank you. Thank you all. We have gone so fast through this time and we're out of time. We've got to move into the panel conversation, but I want to thank Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis, State Secretary Feicht, uh, Chair Hochschild, Glenn, Kathy, for your industry perspective. I thought that was fabulously um, a healthy conversation. Thank you for the passion and the information that we've got now. Uh, thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Britta. You bet. Thank you very much. Thank you. So let's, let's move now into our next panel area. Um, as a reminder, the purpose of today's panel discussion is to delve even deeper into the challenges and opportunities of accelerating the widespread adoption of zero emission vehicles. And I think the previous um, speakers actually teed up some, some nice areas where there are some challenges for us to really talk about. So hopefully some of that will actually uh, just um, you know sm uh, blend in right into what we're talking about here. We have five very accomplished experts who will bring different perspectives to this discussion, including the views of government, industry, academia, and the investment community. So let's let's get on it. I'd like to start by introducing the newest commissioner, I believe, uh, with the California Energy Commission, but not new at all to the topic of vehicle electrification in California, Patty Monahan. Patty, could you very briefly just tell us about your expert, uh, EV expertise and what you wanna bring to the discussion today? Sure, Britta. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and I really enjoyed the morning session. Actually, I was very impressed with our lieutenant governor's knowledge of electric vehicles, <laughs> which was really amazing to hear. Um, so, yes, I'm the newest commissioner uh, together with Chair Hoke Shield, and uh, I'm the lead for transportation, and I come with about a long history, several decades worth of um, experience in the transportation sector. And I was really excited to come to California because um, of all the amazing um, leadership that California has displayed for decades on clean transportation. Uh, as the Lieutenant Governor said, transportation is our number one problem in terms of greenhouse gas emissions in California. And we have a big opportunity to 
bend the curve on transportation pollution and head towards zero. Um, and a lot of the conversation this morning was really focused on passenger vehicles, but the governor's executive order includes big rig trucks. It includes off-road vehicles like tractors and trees. So it's really this comprehensive electrification pathway. And uh, so the Energy Commission, uh, where, where David and I work, we are laser focused on making sure that the infrastructure is, is there to support zero emission vehicles. Our fellow uh, agencies, the uh, Air Resources Board is basically the hammer <laughs> in terms of developing the regulations, which I'd love to talk a little bit more about later, uh, and the vehicle incentive. So um, we, together with other agencies, are, are really excited to help implement the executive order and make sure that California can uh, change the direction of transportation pollution, which has been going the wrong way. Thank you, Patty. Another voice well known in vehicle electrification circles in California, the director of the California Electric Transportation Coalition, or as I know as Cal ETC, Eileen Tut. Eileen, what perspective do you want to bring and make sure it gets out into the discussion today on EVs and infrastructure? Well, thank you, Britta. I want to I want to echo Patty listening to the conversation this morning. It made me look forward to the continuing conversations with Germany and the partnership. Um, so at Cal ETC, we really focus on the industry side of this challenge, particularly we work with utilities, but also the OEMs building zero emission cars, trucks, buses, and equipment to accomplish our zero emission mobility goals in a way that supports a safe, reliable, efficiency, efficient, and affordable grid. Um, California, as we heard earlier and we know, is particularly vulnerable to the, the devastation of climate change, um, the most visible being the wildfires that we're currently experiencing. And to be honest, the electricity grid and its resiliency are key to combating these devastating wildfires. Um, with coordination and, acti and active utility support for transportation electrification, alongside the progressive policies that exist in, Cal in California, including the governor's recent executive order, electric vehicles will support our broader efforts to ensure that the electricity grid is resilient and benefits residents and businesses as we link the transportation sector to the grid in a way that strengthens the grid and reduces the cost of electricity for everyone, whether or not you drive an electric vehicle. At this time of pandemic, economic downturn, lost jobs and unemployment, we are particularly eager to work with government to build back our economy in a way that can benefit all Californians. So we are prioritizing bringing zero emission transportation, affordable electricity fuel, good jobs and careers to the communities that have historically been harmed by systemic, economic, environmental and racial injustices. We can come back from 2020 better. I know that with a more equitable economy environment and we are ready to do that, so thank you. Thank you, Eileen. I think those are some of the sentiments also expressed by uh, Chair Hochschild. Thank you. Uh, now, for a voice steeped in experience gained actually putting technology solutions in place at the intersection of electric vehicles and the grid on both sides of the pond, correct me if I'm wrong, let me introduce the Chief Executive Officer of Hubjack, Christian Hahn. Christian? Yep, thank you, Britta. Yeah. First, let me start to say thank you again to be part of this wonderful event. Um, I really uh, highlighted that I, that I able to join this. And you mentioned already, Britta, as Hubject, uh, we are in, uh, responsible for bringing all the companies, all the stakeholders together, because that's what we already have heard today, that we need to cooperate and collaborate, not only industry and governments, but also companies itself. They need to collaborate to make the change happen we have heard that we all need to have more vehicles on the road, but also different kinds of vehicles. We have heard that passenger cars are quite important, but also commercial vehicles. And these electrified vehicles, they all need to get access to different kinds of charging infrastructure. And that's exactly what we are doing in Germany, in Europe, but also in the North American market to bring all the companies together on a digital marketplace so that they are able to, to collaborate. We call this roaming, e-roaming, um, which is derived from the mobile phone industry so that they can all do business with each other. Because in the end, we all need to make sure that the EV drivers get as simple as possible access to all the charging stations around them. And that needs collaboration again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. 
Um, next, a former energy consultant with expertise in energy policy, renewables, and in the grid integration of e-mobility, currently a PhD researcher with the Hauti School in Berlin. I'm pleased to introduce Silvana Tiedemann. Silvana? Yeah, thanks, Britta. So um, as Britta just said, I'm focusing on energy policy and electricity market design, as well as grid in uh, integration of EV in my research. And what I bring to the table today is really hands-on experience as a consultant in designing energy policy. So really like assisting the regulatory to uh, the, the regulatory bodies to go through the process of executing the policy reforms. But I also helped grid operators to prepare their businesses for e-mobility in an environment of high uncertainty. So uncertainty regarding the exact timing of the EV uptake, but also uncertainty regarding the charging capacities. Kathy Zoy just mentioned the dynamic development here and the charging locations, the charging concepts, and even the underlying mobility concepts. So how do we drive in the future? What brings us from A to B? And what I would like to underline today is really the need to have effective and reliable policies. So stable policies for EV charging as a key success factor for the EV revolution we are currently seeing. And I'm looking very much forward to the uh, upcoming discussion. Thank you. Me too. Thank you, Silvana. Uh, last member of our panel here comes with three decades of experience in investment banking and fund management. Just the voice we need to help us understand how the private market ultimately becomes the accelerator of EVs and charging infrastructure investment. Please meet co-founder and partner of Alexa Capital, Gerard Reed. Great. So it's great to be here. So look, I, I come from a different world, right? I don't come from the regulatory world, the consultancy world. I come from the finance world. And I, I, I want to start by just reading something that um, I read at the beginning of the year. And I thought it would take a few years to come into being, but it's actually happened very quickly. So this is from Larry Fink. Larry Fink is the CEO of BlackRock, which is the largest asset management business in the world. At the beginning of the year, he wrote and published a paper called A Fundamental Reshaping of Finance. Let me just read out three, three sentences from him. He says, number one, the evidence on climate risk is compelling investors to reassess core assumptions about modern finance. Number two, investors are increasingly reckoning that these questions and recognizing that climate risk is investment risk. And the third one, and this is very important, because capital markets pull future risk forward, we will see changes in capital allocation more quickly than we will see changes to the climate itself. Now, here we are, October 2020, and let me tell you what's happened in the stock market this year. The share price of ExxonMobil has fallen 50%. The share price of Next Era, a US utility, has gone up 20%. Next Era is now the biggest energy company in the Western world, right? It's not ExxonMobil anymore. ExxonMobil 10 years ago was the biggest company in the world. It is a US utility. The best performing energy stock worldwide is a Danish utility called Orsted, which is the leader in offshore wind. Now, why do I say that? Because the capital is moving away from all this fossil fuels into low carbon. And it's the exact same thing in automobile space. So if I look at automobile, there has been this year 10 companies globally that have gone and listed. That means they've IPO'd, whether that's most of them in the US or China raised $25 billion in new capital. And if you look at the best performing sector worldwide, it's in the automobile sector. It's anything to do with electromobility, right? A average EV company that's gone listed in the market is up fourfold, 400%. Imagine you put 100 euros in, it's now worth 400 euros within nine months, okay? Now, if I look at the automobile manufacturers, the incumbents, all their share prices are down year to date. All of them are down. And I would just say that to you, this is very important to realize is that the, that the finance industry has made a decision that money is going into this, into, into low carbon technologies. And as a result, I'm much more positive that this transition will happen faster than what we all think. Thank you, Gerard. All right, this is gonna be some fun and I am trying to keep up with questions here, but let me kick it off with one of my own right now. Over the past year, Germany has seen I would just say dramatic growth in EV sales as a portion of new vehicle sales. Just this year alone, 
between May and I think it was the end of September, monthly new vehicle sales of EVs rose from 7% of market share to 15%. California has maintained steady EV market share of eight to 9% for several years now. I think it goes back at least three years, maybe more. Are any of you seeing any stresses or shortcomings anywhere in the system? And are we ready for even more exponential EV growth given the conversation we're having today about we're probably not even doing enough? Are we ready for this kind of growth that starts happening now and takes us through 2030? Thoughts? Well, I can Maybe. start. Um, let me just say, get a, a California perspective. And we have kind of held steady. We have been half of the US sales, but I would say that there have been sort of a limited model availability of late. And, and that uh, in terms of new vehicles, and I think the next several years we are seeing, I mean, this year with the, the ID4, which will be in mass production next year, there's some exciting new vehicles coming to market. Uh, the Ford F-150, the Rivian truck, which is pretty uh, interesting. And they're looking, Amazon has purchased 100,000 Rivian trucks. So I, I would say that <clears throat> I am more heartened when we get some new models that consumers will be excited about that are beyond just uh, your, your, your sedan. Um, I would also say, you know, we've been somewhat challenged by the federal government. Uh, the federal government has attacked our zero emission vehicle policy and you know, my hope is that we will have uh, an administration that's going to be more friendly to California in the future, and we'll be able to pass a stronger ZEV mandate post-2025, and that will also lead to an acceleration. Thank you, Patty. Christian, do you want to weigh in on this one? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I think it's great that we now see that the market is lifting up uh, here in Europe, but as well as in, in, in California. That's great. That's what we worked on for years now. Um, but of course, we will definitely see some new challenges from my point of view. We already mentioned today that we need to take care of the so-called grid integration so that the electric vehicles are properly um, connected to the electricity grid, which sounds simple, but we also know already from some projects that this can become challenging if there are a lot of electric vehicles at the same place, which can be passenger cars when they are charging at home but can also be again commercial vehicles when they are being recharged um, at, the, at the companies. So therefore I think we need to find a good way how this can work. And of course this uh, is a bit more complex because then again, mobility, which already consists of different industries needs to, to get the support of the energy um, industry of the utilities. And therefore we would definitely need to find a way also how we can um, harmonize the different um, energy markets. So all over Europe, we have different kinds of regulations in place, uh, different approaches. And as far as understood, this is a bit similar in the US that from state to state, the energy market works a bit different. And I think that's something we need to solve quite soon that we can have a good and standardized integration of electric vehicles into the electricity grid. Yeah, let me throw something else into the conversation that Kathy said. Kathy was talking about soft costs on the last panel. And she was talking about if we can't address um, things like permitting challenges, um, utility interconnection processes, if we can't get some of the systemic problems solved, we're going to have trouble attracting private investment into the market, which is going to be critical to scale here. And so I just I want to just also put that into the conversation here that in the US, for example, we have thousands and thousands of local jurisdictions that control permitting, building, you know, building codes, et cetera. Um, and utilities, 3,200 utilities. So it isn't like we have three you know, utilities we can go to and say, here, this is all you guys got to do. We have 3,000 conversations we probably have to have. So I want to, again, are we ready for this kind of scale? So maybe I just, what, what I think is we're not ready, but it's great that it's coming because I think the system needs stress. I actually wrote a blog a few years ago and I said, why we need to have a blackout in Europe? And the reason I said it is because what we tend to do is we don't think systemically about how we get to where we want to get to. What we do is we keep adding legislation and regulations and they get bigger and more complex. And this is at the central government level, this is at the EU level, and this is at the local level. 
And then what happens is nothing happens, right? And uh, but what I found very interesting about the automobile situation is one is, if I may say, you've got the lobbying power of a Volkswagen, Tesla, and these very big companies who are saying, listen, listen, government, listen, EU, you guys need to change the regulations because if you don't, the Chinese are going to steal our industry in, in, in years to come. So this suddenly industrial policy suddenly gets into this electrification thing. And as a result, I think we're going to see big changes in regulations in the next few years because otherwise we're going to have real problems. There are, if I may just briefly um, step in there, um, I would actually not be so sure that a huge blackout would help the um, electric vehicle industry. Um, I'd rather say that having a rather um, proactive approach to grid planning, to designing the correct policies that avoid having uh, grid out and blackouts would be the key success factor to um, make sure that electric vehicles will be um, ramping up soon. To put it in different words, I guess if you have a blackout, you, you as a pol like somebody as a policymaker would have to reassure the society for quite a long time that there is really no problem, that there are enough measures in, in, in place and so on to stabilize the grid. So I would rather say that um, in an, from an academic debate, but also as a policymaker, you should rather take a proactive standpoint, learn from each other, try to identify the key success for factors in international experience. And yes, also think 10, 15, 20 years ahead of time, what are the charging infrastructure needs? What are the grid investment requirements that we need at this particular time? So I'm not a very big fan of a perspective um, which says, okay, we need a catastrophe first yeah. in order to get I, things I'm being, right. I'm being <laughs> provocative, right? Don't forget, I'm being provocative when I say that, right? Because what you want to do is you get people to think, but really this transition we're going through, it's not, we're talking about mobility here, right? The transition we're going through is really, really, really complex because you've got not just electrification of transport, you've got the renewableization of electricity, and you've probably got the electrification of energy as well going on at the same time. Really complex transition, right? So you have to think systemic. That's what I'm trying to trying to say. And I see a lot of regulators not thinking and, and governments not thinking systemic. And that makes it for the finance world, I say it from the finance world very difficult to deploy capital. And if you look in the renewable space the last decade, I would call it chasing subsidies. That's what finance people have done for 10 years, right? And we can continue doing that because we like subsidies because it puts money in our pocket. But is that really good for society to be doing that? Yeah, I, Gerard, I like where you headed with that comment. Yes, it's provocative. Um, you sound like the tough parent. But I think what you also highlight is, uh, uh, you know, for, for sure here in the US, you know, Americans really don't understand how cheap electricity is, how cheap gasoline is. And so there, there hasn't been really a wake up call on a lot of these different issues. So I totally get what you're saying. You know, do we, we kind of need to wake everybody up here. There's a lot of issues here in our way. So I appreciate where that dialogue has gone. Anyone else want to weigh in on this one? Or did we get around? Yeah, Britta, I just want to say that I think this is an area where the California utilities can serve as an example. Um, that the I think the the interconnection time frames and all that part of that is it's not if you look at the the number there's like 42 Cal there are 42 utilities in California some of them municipal some of them investor owned and the challenge on the investor owned utilities is that it's not just the interconnection timelines are not just they're, they're not just determined by the utilities themselves they're determined by the regulators and the regulators on, on my perspective also can be an example in California but they need to ramp up their game because at this at the, the utilities are actually being more aggressive and they want it they want to electrify fast it's good for them it's good for the grid it's it it fits right in with their resiliency efforts, which are so important in California. And so they wanna do this. And what we need is a, is a regulatory framework that allows the utilities to actively invest and, and cuts back on the interconnection time. Because you can see it in the municipal utilities, you can see them in a lot of ways being ahead of their big giant investor owned counterparts. And that and part of that is just that, that they're kind of keeping up with the 
the realities that we're facing. The white, like there are no blackouts in in our in our local Sacramento municipal utility <laughs> service territory where there there are massive blackout blackouts in some of our investor-owned utilities. And so part of that is, and and they're not, you know, fortunately the utilities are doing a great job in keeping the blackouts short as possible and really keeping our our, our state safe. So I don't want to say those are bad things, but I do think that on some level. Um, we need both, we need policies that are more progressive and utilities that want to be active, want to make this transition and want to do it just as Gerard said, in a way that recognizes that, that it's all interconnected and, and we can, if we do this right, we can, we can reduce the cost of electricity even further and make our grid much, much safer. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the future and I think California can be an example for the rest of the country and already serves an example, particularly in the utility sector. Patty? I just wanna just uh, really quick to add on to that. Um, so it, it, the Edison Electric Institute, which is the big, uh, basically all the utilities, it's the trade association for the utilities, recently signed uh, an MOU with two environmental groups and two groups representing consumer interests, one low income consumer interest. And they basically said, and these, these guys don't talk to each other. <laughs> you know, generally, environmental groups, consumer groups, and uh, Edison Electric Institute, they don't really like each other. Uh, but they signed a, a memorandum, memorandum of understanding saying, hey, we need to work together on transportation electrification because this could be good for all electricity users, especially low income. Because as Eileen said, if you do it right, it lowers rates for everybody. Basically, you have fixed costs, you have more folks using electricity, that means lower costs for everybody. And, but, uh, you know, as Silvana said, it's really important the timing of how, when and how you charge. So there's a lot of planning that has to go into that. But to me, that really speaks to this opportunity. Like we need to do electric vehicle charging, right? If we do, it benefits everybody. So let's look at this as an opportunity that we need to capitalize on rather than something that's like overwhelmingly difficult. I actually think we, with the right policies and the right technologies, we can, we can have this like, EV charging happy hour where we have a lot of renewable energy and instead of curtailing it, we're, we're plugging in our vehicles at that time of day and benefiting everybody. Thank you. Thank you. You know, before I leave this question, I kind of want to go back to Silvana, something that you actually brought up a week ago in a conversation we were having about whether the grid is ready in Germany um, for large scale widespread adoption of EVs. Just what are your thoughts again about is the grid ready to handle 100% you know, EVs? So I would say that the DSOs and the TSOs in Germany are doing a pretty good job in maintaining the grid as it is today. And they did a pretty good job as well in integrating renewables, so on the supply side. I guess when this development started in the beginning, um, companies, policymakers, um, the general public was very skeptical that the grid could maintain a share of 5, 10, 15 percent of renewables. Now, in some areas, um, we are up to 80 percent, for example, at the, uh, at the east uh, of Germany. So I think we can learn from the this um, story from the renewable energy integration for um, EV um, grid integration. Now, what do we learn from that is that we basically need planning ahead of time. And when we're talking planning in the, the grid area, we are not talking, talking two to five years, we are talking more 10, 15, 20 years ahead of time. And this becomes particularly challenging when we're talking, for example, about urban areas where you have to secure land um, rights in order to build new charge, um, not new charging station, but new grid infrastructure and so on and so forth. So I think the grid will be ready in some time um, to come, but in order to do so, there really needs to be a dialogue between grid operators, mobility providers, but also housing companies, for example, on what is the development we want to see and we will see what are the uncertainties connected to that? And if we do not have this dialogue, then we might face issues about curtailment of electric uh, vehicles. And that's really not something we would like to run into. Perfect, thank you. Let's, let's build off that to go into the next question. I'm looking at an awful lot of uh, questions uh, here from the audience. And there are a lot of questions that are sort of getting to this idea of like, what keeps you up at night? I, I'm seeing a lot of like, well, what do you think about lithium availability? What do you think about 
um, sustainable sourcing of materials. What do you think about even having the, having the EVs seamlessly integrate into the grid? Um, there are questions about dynamic rate structures um, and time of use. So I guess let's just go around quickly. What keeps you up when we think about 2030 and you know tens, hundreds of millions of EVs on the grid? What is keeping you up at night? Maybe I could start with Gerard. So what keeps me up actually is, I was gonna, I call it the incumbents risk, which is that the uh, existing companies, whether they're existing utilities or oil companies or even automobile manufacturers, just block change. Um, I think that's the thing that keeps me up. And I've been financing energy technology companies for many, many years. And what I would say is that's what incumbents do very well. They block change. And what I get very excited about is the technologies and the new business models I see out there but I will say again, it's still very difficult to get a lot of these to market. And I give a very simple example of batteries, right? If I take the case of California, it might be okay, right? But if I look across the whole of Europe, there's really two countries, the country I come from, Ireland, and the UK, where really batteries make sense. Nothing to do with economics. It's to do with a regulatory environment, right? The regulatory environment in Germany, you have grid charges every time you charge a battery. Well, that kills the battery, the business model straight away. So I go back to... It's regulations and the power of incumbents that, that are the thing that really I wake up and go, well, what's going to stop this transition? Thank you. Christian, thoughts? Sure. Um, I, I have two thoughts which uh, keep me awake at the night. Uh, one, one thought is how can we establish a charging ecosystem which is open for innovation, even if we know we need regulation and we need um, regulatory support? But we also know that this is a really thin line we are working on because a bit too much regulation can also avoid specific business models and, and, and technologies. And therefore, I think we need to be very, very careful. Even if you need regulation, you have the right amount of uh, regulation in place. And sometimes we already see some signals, first signals that maybe too much regulation is not really bringing, bringing the market forward. Um, and a second topic, which is maybe more kind of of um, theoretical topic, but still, um, I think it's important to mention. And the topic is, how can we establish a level playing field in the EV industry? So uh, Shara just mentioned an example, how existing companies are blocking innovation. Um, but we also see, of course, that the capital now being invested into the EV market is becoming bigger and bigger. Big budgets are now in the game. Um, but we also know that we need startup companies um, as an ease in place. And, which haven't maybe the budget. And therefore we need to establish a kind of rule set that we have, of course, the big uh, players in the market, which are doing the big investments, but also allow that startup companies, uh, young companies, um, companies from other industries can be part of the market as well, because that what I think brings us innovation, that there's not one industry in place, but we have the influence, the impact of a lot of different industries who are creating a much better EV market of the future. Eileen, thoughts on this one? Yeah, yeah, I think I, I, I think there's a lot of things that keep me up at night, but particularly sort of the charging infrastructure access and how we do that, making sure that um, that we that because we we're coming back. This is an unprecedented time, and I guess as we come back, I just want to make sure that this opportunity for, for zero emission mobility op options and zero emission trucks that are delivering goods and last mile and all the things that are coming into our communities that, that everyone benefits. So, so that, that means that we, we, have to, we have to create a resilient grid and electric, electric vehicles will be a big part of that. But we wanna make sure that as we build out resiliency and, and combine, you know, keep all these you know, renewables, resiliency, Electric, electrification all aligned and working together that we don't create a situation which is very common and exists in California and I think in the, in the US and the rest of the world where, where you end up in a situation where people, low income people, people of color end up paying more for a product in this case, say electricity fuel, then some, then more affluent people. And we can't, we've got to protect against that. So if you live in a, an apartment complex or you live in a, a, a low income home that you own or rent, then we need to make that electricity fuel accessible to you and just as affordable and inexpensive as it is 
for those who live in more affluent communities. And that that kind of that's going to be hard to do because we have a it's systemic. We we have a we have a system that sets up it's it's cheaper to buy goods if, if you're wealthy than if you're poor. And we got to make sure that doesn't happen in the world of electrification. So that's that's kind of what I think that's my number one what keeps me up at night. Thank you. I'm sorry, guys, we are completely out of time. Obviously, we could have gone much, much longer. I love ending on that note, Eileen, about uh, lifting up disadvantaged communities while we are at this big transformation. I want to thank every one of you for participating today. Uh, let me move on very quickly in the time that remains. I just want to summarize what I think I've heard today. There's, there's way, there was way too much um, meat and, and, and importance here in what was said. But I was hearing things like, Climate risk is investment risk, so we need to get on it. We need to think about taking soft costs out of these systems to make the market attractive to private investment. They need confidence and certainty to invest. Um, we heard about the need for reliable and sustained policies. I loved how the first uh, keynote speaker panel talked about how they early on had short-term policies, and now they're going for the long-term. They're looking at 10 year, 15 year, 20 year policies. So that's been a major shift here uh, that we've seen here in both Germany and in, in California. In California. Um, the need to lift up disadvantaged communities. Love that California is talking about 10 times as much energy storage as before. As before. Um, interesting to hear that Germany is looking at bi-directional vehicle to grid capabilities as part of the solution space. Um, we also heard of course, about the you know the phase out of ICEs, we had a long enough conversation about that. I think that's an exciting, exciting thing. Let me right now. Let's move on. I want to get to our closing speaker. It's my distinct honor to introduce you uh, to a woman who has had a long and distinguished career in public service, including positions at the German Embassy in Moscow and the Embassy in Ankara, Turkey, and as Director General for Political Affairs in the Federal Foreign Office in Berlin. In fact. She was the first woman to hold this role. More recently, she served as the state secretary in both the federal foreign office and in the ministry of the interior. And she's currently serving as the German ambassador to the United States. Please allow me to introduce to all of you, Ambassador Emily Haber. Please ambassador. Thank you, Rita Gross for this introduction. And I must say, it's really good to see uh, a large number of participants uh, to uh, this conference. Um, before the pandemic struck, my last trip when travel was still possible brought me to California. That was late February, uh, early March. And I look back fondly to the time when travel was still uh, 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 possible. It was my first trip to California. So it wasn't uh, the first time that I saw uh, the huge potential of cooperation for cooperation between California and uh, Germany firsthand. But it was very impressive. And this potential is true for many sectors. Um, and it's certainly one of them is energy. And that's why today's forum, uh, this forum is so important. And so is its topic. Electro mobility will certainly be one of the key technologies to achieve greater uh, sector coupling and therefore decarbonization. I share uh, uh, Lieutenant Governor Kunolaki's thoughts uh, that in times of uncertainty, you need to partner with countries or actors that are like-minded. You need to team up and you need to be capable to confront and face challenges together. The German government as the Californian government uh, is greatly concerned uh, about climate change and about uh, environmental degradation and the impact uh, both can have uh, on nature and humanity. At the same time, uh, we believe that climate protection and sustainable growth can go hand in hand. Protecting the climate can mean creating new uh, jobs and triggering innovation and spurring economic growth. We both um, support the aims and the targets of the Paris Agreement. And we're undertaking many efforts actually to achieve these goals and targets uh, on both sides of the Atlantic, in California and in Germany. And as far as Germany goes, not only uh, within Germany, but also on the European level, all of you will know uh, 
that the president of the European uh, Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, is seeing combating climate change as one of the major uh, challenges of our time. She's announced a Green uh, New Deal that aims at making European member states uh, um, climate neutral by 2050. That's a very ambitious goal because it means uh, that there will be no net greenhouse emission gas emissions uh, uh, within 30 years, which in turn means that we'll have to define very ambitious uh, um, uh, targets tackling uh, major sectors such as energy and transportation and construction uh, um, uh, and agriculture. It's obvious that no country can tackle climate change alone. Um, the more we can partner with like-minded, the more exchange we have, exchange about uh, experiences and sometimes also about what went wrong, um, the better it will be for all of us. And Germany couldn't think of a better partner in this than California. And that's why this conference is so uh, important. As in uh, California, um, for example, security um, and uh, of supply and resilience are key uh, objectives, targets of uh, Germany's uh, uh, energy policy. We are phasing out, as you know, uh, uh, nuclear power and coal at the same time, gradually replacing it uh, with um, renewable energy, uh, most of it from uh, variable sources, integrating them and maintaining a high um, security standard of, for supply uh, is a great uh, uh, challenge. Second, uh, like California, Germany pursues green recovery. We have earmarked a substantial amount of the 130 uh, billion euro uh, stimulus package uh, for green projects, for green policy uh, measures, such as deployment of renewable energies, uh, uh, energy efficient refurbishment uh, of houses, hydrogen, aviation, and so forth. Let me give you one brief example. The German government uh, has passed a national hydrogen uh, strategy uh, this summer. The goal is to support a rapid market ramp up for, for green hydrogen uh, in Germany and use green and carbon neutral hydrogen to decarbonize uh, uh, sectors, or at least to abate such as the heavy industry and the chemical industry or aviation and freight. And since we forecast that our domestic demand for carbon neutral uh, green hydrogen uh, will be greatly about above our uh, domestic production, we'll have to look for partners and regions uh, and countries uh, to cooperate uh, there as well. And here, um, I'm sure this will be yet another field uh, where we can uh, closely work uh, hand uh, in glove. But California is not only a politically like-minded partner, it is also uh, an economic powerhouse. As you all know, uh, uh, California, uh, were it a sovereign national state, uh, would rank fifth uh, as a, a world economy. Um, many of German businesses, uh, companies do business there, and I know that a couple of them uh, uh, are taking uh, are taking part in today's uh, conference. Therefore, um, cooperating on energy matters really does make sense in economic terms as well. We both have been uh, leaders uh, in the industrialized world when it comes to undertaking ambitious efforts towards transitioning uh, our energy systems. We've been criticized uh, at times for some of our political decisions. Uh, and sure, perhaps not everything we've done uh, turned out to be right, and we may have made mistakes, but we learned uh, our lessons, uh, and it's important to exchange our experiences. Uh, and that's what we're doing. From our point of view, the political challenge uh, for climate protection uh, and sustainable growth uh, is to incentivize changes in lifestyle to adapt legislation and uh, regulation, uh, to um, uh, promote innovation, and to make sure that there is a balance between all of these objectives uh, that is uh, acceptable to the society in its entirety. To achieve these goals on a global scale, 
which we must. We need the United States. And we need a constructive effort of the United States. We need the United States to bring in its huge potential, its technological um, possibilities, its uh, creativity. All of that is necessary for a global approach. And we know that California has played a pioneering role in the United States in this. And that's why California is such a strategically important partner for my country, for Germany. And we value this uh, partnership intensely. And I hope we'll be able to uh, continue this cooperation in future. Thank um, you. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. Let me just a final word. Uh, I hope that the next bilateral Germany-California uh, uh, um, energy conference will take place next year, including in-person meetings. But meanwhile, and for the moment, uh, thank you uh, to you and thank you to so many who participate virtually today and are part of uh, a success story. Thank you for that. No, thank you, Ambassador. That was brilliant. It was profound. Thank you for, for your support of this transatlantic cooperation. Thank you for the, for the final thoughts about uh, the US and the kind of support that you're looking for. So uh, much, much appreciated. I wanna thank all the speakers and panelists today. I wanna thank everyone in the audience for your compelling questions. Sorry, we couldn't get to everything, um, but thank you for your provocative thinking on these subjects and what keeps you up at night too. I want to thank everyone who helped organize uh, this event. Couldn't have happened without the parties in California and in Germany making sure this event could happen. Um, I want to remind everyone that the Chinese script, as we learned today from Chair Hochschild, is that Christ, the Chinese script for crisis means danger plus opportunity. I thought that was a fabulous takeaway. Let's focus on that opportunity as encouragement. Um, as with the ambassador, I'm very personally looking forward to a continuation of this conference next year, again, perhaps live, perhaps virtual. I think the key is that it happens regardless and that we keep the dialogue coming, uh, continuing, because not only are these two parties committed to a carbon neutral planet, but daring to take the actions that are needed. Thank you for leading the way. Everyone have a great rest of your day. Thank you, guten Abend, and goodbye, everybody. <laughs>